so um the last class okay we um, looked at the effect of uh, roughness on um, uh, pipe flow and uh, we also looked at how to deal with um, uh, non circular cross sections right so just to write down uh, we started by looking at uh, uh, laminar flow in pipes then uh, we realized that uh, uh, that's not always the case if Reynolds number is sufficiently large then the flow does not remain laminar the flow goes to turbulent and therefore it was uh, necessary to look at um, uh, the relation between friction factor and Reynolds number for turbulent flow in pipes then we realize that um, if you are looking at turbulent flow then um, the roughness of the pipe can be important so we looked at uh, uh, roughness we defined a roughness factor we calculated what is the relationship between friction factor and roughness and then we uh, sort of generalized our procedure by looking at non-circular pipes and to apply all the formalism that we derived for uh, uh, circular pipes we actually defined a hydraulic diameter and then we said that we would just replace use the hydraulic diameter to deal with the non-circular pipes so that has really been the course so far so we defined a hydraulic diameter so is that all that we need if you want to talk about a pipe design in a uh, in a practical uh, case so do we know everything now how to select a pump for a given application is there something that you think is missing uh, something is missing okay and that's what is the next thing that we want to look at and that's called the minor losses so the minor losses okay is pressure drop that can happen that we have not accounted for yet and the possible reasons could be what happens at the entrance or exit length it could be due to um, sudden expansion or contractions you could have uh, bends elbows fittings and so on you could have valves uh, you know open or partially open you could have a gradual expansions or contractions so when you think about a general pipe okay system where you are pumping fluid from one place to another many of these things could come okay and all of them can contribute to additional pressure drop so we also need to know what those losses are and the losses that happen due to any of these things are called minor losses though it's called minor losses it may not be really minor okay many times that would be the major losses so it's important that we account for this hmm? so that we need to just look at some of these situations uh, and then see what is the way in which we can um, really attack it so the first thing that we would look at entrance and exit length entrance length is the only thing that i'll talk about so what is entrance length so when we started our class you may remember that we talked about um, pipe and uh, a fluid that's coming in with a uniform velocity 
and uh, as soon as the fluid touches the wall the fluid will get slowed down and then it will take a it will take some length before it will reach the fully developed flow right and the length that is required to reach the fully developed flow is called the entrance length right so and all our analysis so far has been assuming that the fluid flow is fully developed so the flow or the pressure law pressure loss that would happen during the entrance loss is something that we have not calculated yet and therefore that should be accounted for additionally whenever you have so the point is can that be significant okay so let's see what are the typical um, entrance lengths that you will have okay there is no real theory but there are uh, correlations which uh, one could use so so if uh, so let's say this is uh, entrance length let's say l e beyond which you will start seeing um, fully developed profile so that's l e by r where r is the radius of the pipe is given by 0.49 plus 0.11 Reynolds number for laminar flow. So if the fluid flow is laminar, okay, then uh, you can estimate what is the approximate entrance length. So let's say uh, the highest Reynolds number at which you will get uh, laminar flow in a pipe would be approximately 2000, 2100. If uh, Reynolds number is 2100, let's say, what would be Le? Some 2000 into 0.11 plus 0.49, something like 200 plus. Okay. Comes out to be 230R. Okay. So that means, is there anything? Uh, so 230R, okay. That means the entrance length is going to be 200 times longer you know compared to the radius so it's not a small number so if you are dealing with one meter sized pipe the first 230 meter would be entrance length only after that you are going to get a fully developed profile okay so therefore the the uh, the calculations are not the calculations that we have done so far is not true for the first 230 r length okay and therefore it has to be separately accounted for even in turbulent flow it's um, Le is found to be approximately 160 R to 200 R. Okay, so that's also sufficiently large. So whether it's laminar or turbulent, there is enough length of the pipe in which the flow is just in its developing state. So um, the way typically that you would see is that we need to talk about um, um, uh, a head loss okay which is related to your pressure drop right that's the way we defined our head loss uh, we can say our delta p is now coming from the fully developed flow plus a delta p that's additionally there due to the entrance effect hmm so how did we write uh, delta p in terms of tau w the wall shear stress what is the definition of what is the connection between uh, head loss and the wall shear stress is that all hmm okay so Therefore, it's a good idea to define delta P divided by 2 tau W is delta P F D divided by 2 tau W plus delta P E N divided by 2 tau W that's equal to <coughs> L by R plus let's say some L star by R. So what I'm just trying to rewrite is that the pressure difference, so the pressure drop, okay, can be really thought about as an extra length. 
and that extra length is called L star. And what is what you will find in literature is expressions for L star, which you can use and calculate what is the extra pressure drop that can come from entrance length. Is that okay? So, not L star is not same as L E, okay, L E is actually the original entrance length, L star is that, that length which would have contributed uh, to the pressure drop, that extra additional length, hmm? L star by R is equal to 0 0.0709 Reynolds number plus 0 0.589 for laminar flow and uh, is equal to 0 0.72 divided by F for turbulent flow. So you can use those to calculate what is the additional pressure drop. Okay. So that's what typically happens uh, with entrance and we can talk about sudden expansion and contraction. Okay, so it's very common, for example, uh, you were pumping fluid through some pipe, okay, and let's say it needs to be divided or it needs to be connected to a larger pipe, okay. So it's very usual that the pipe dimensions will immediately change. So you'll see that uh, up to some length you had something and then suddenly you will connect it to a bigger pipe to which, um, uh, through which the fluid needs to go. Okay, so that's where you have a sudden expansion. So what would happen? is that the fluid that's coming okay like that it does not stick to the wall in fact the one which is coming at the center will go at the center the one which is next to it will expand a little bit and go the one which is next to it will expand more and go like that okay so that's what the fluid profile is going to look like okay so the fluid layer that's very close to the wall would expand and then go so here what happens is that there will be fluid but those fluids would be just recirculating like that there will be fluids which are just getting recirculated the fluid that's coming would expand and occupy the pipe only after a certain length okay so so that means that you the the uh, the fluid that's occupying this region, right? This the region at the corners are just getting rotated, but they are not moving anywhere. So you are actually losing additional energy because of that, right? You are not getting anything from that. You are having extra energy to just generate those vortices there, and those losses are actually huge. Okay, so therefore, sudden expansions will result in additional losses that ha we haven't captured yet from our friction factor calculation. So we need a friction way of calculating friction factor associated with this sud sudden expansion. So similarly, this similar thing could happen in case of a sudden contraction. So in if you have a pipe with um, um, a large cross section and is suddenly changing to a small cross section, the fluid that's coming would start actually the one at the center would go, the one would actually contract a little bit before it's expanding, something like that. Okay, so the fluid that's coming, as soon as it see a contraction, it will continue like that, it will contract a little bit before it expands, okay. So again, you will have 
regions where you will have these kind of circulations. I'm not doing it right. Okay, so this is these are called flow separated regions, and we will see the and reason why that happens later. But those regions are again created. Okay, so these losses are again something that we have not considered. So therefore, there can be expansion losses. There can be contraction losses whenever the cross section changes, which needs to be accounted for in addition to the non uh, losses. So really, you know, whenever um, the so see, I, originally, for example, if you look at laminar flow. Where is the friction really coming from? The friction was coming from the walls, right? That's what we accounted for. Now here, the additional friction is coming because either the magnitude of velocity changes or the direction of velocity changes. Actually, both change here, right? The magnitude and the direction, both of them change. So if you look at two consecutive fluid elements, their velocities might be different, both in direction and in magnitude. That means that they are going to experience extra friction. Okay, so it's really that extra friction that's resulting in additional losses, which was not the case when we had a uniform pipe. The there the only um, fr the only way in which the velocity is changing is when you are going perpendicular to the flat plate or perpendicular to the pipe cross section. So that's the only way friction was exhibiting. If you're going along the pipe, there was no difference in the uh, velocity of fluid elements and there was no friction. But now that's not the case. Here, any two consecutive elements you're looking at, there is going to be ex difference in the velocity. And if two things are moving with a relative velocity, you would expect that there is going to be friction acting between them. Okay, so therefore, whenever there is a change in the magnitude or direction of velocity, you would expect that there is going to be additional losses in addition to the circulations that we have already talked about. So there are like two different contributions really. One is because of the change in the magnitude and direction of the velocity. And second is because the flow is separated like, you know, near the corners or near this, the one which I have drawn here. So these are various contributions that are going to give additional pressure drops and are going to be something major also. Hmm? So again, uh, the one can't really do any calculations and figure out these things. So okay, it's very difficult to do it. So typically one goes with again correlations. Hmm? And uh, often you would write that uh, uh, you will talk about um, uh, head loss, let's say, um, minor head loss hm is uh, yeah is the pressure drop Okay, so that was so our original definition of HF, okay, the friction factor where we defined it as delta P by rho G. I'm not including delta Z because delta Z contribution is going to be small for any of these changes. So HM is delta P by rho G and we often define a loss coefficient KM as HM divided by V square by 2g. So v square by 2g is the velocity head. So we often represent our um, minor head loss as a ratio of minor head loss to the velocity head and therefore that at km is going to be a non-dimensional quantity and the numbers that you will have often access to is km. So the moment you have k you can multiply it with the v square by 2g the velocity head and get your friction loss okay um, hmm, yeah so this is loss coefficient that's velocity head um, km again often independent of uh, Reynolds number 
roughness and so on. So you will see that the dependencies are weak. So you will actually get it as some number like 0.1 or 10 or things like that. Okay. It's very, it's a function of the geometry. So for example, you will find that Km could be dependent upon the, uh, you know, the radius of the smaller section and the radius of the bigger section and so on. But you will not generally see it as written as functions of the flow field or Reynolds number. And uh, the other thing is that what is the V that I have written there? Velocity head. What is that V? Huh? Average velocity. But average velocity where? So there's a convention involved. And that convention is that the ve average velocity in the smaller pipe. Okay. So that's what typically one should use. So in the expansion, it will be the inlet average velocity in the... Um, contraction it will be the outlet average velocity so that v associated is um, uh, that in the narrower channel okay so we we'll look at expansion in a little more detail maybe next class. But before that, let's look at other things. Um, bends, elbows, bend. Why would, uh, you know, uh, let's say a bend in the pipe or an elbow that you will collect. For example, you need to take the pipe like this and then take a corner and go. Why would that cause additional losses? Something. Okay, the fluid is going like that. It could be a sharp 90 degree bend or uh, anything. So, what would the fluid experience when it goes through something like this? The additional force that it would experience would be centrifugal force. Okay, so in addition to the fluid that's going to go like that, because the fluid experiences centrifugal force, it will start exhibiting additional flows. Okay. We have actually seen one example when we did the um, uh, Taylor cubit flow where we had flow between two parallel plates and one sorry two concentric cylinders and one of the cylinder was rotating and we saw that when the Reynolds number was really small it was only like this but as it was increasing additional flow fields developed. Okay. So similarly what happens is that even though the flow field is the primary flow okay is along the bend it will develop a secondary flow and uh, that secondary flow will be actually you know uh, across the section so something like that you know some sort of a helical pattern so the fluid will start exhibiting flow like that so that's something that we have not accounted for yet okay so that gives rise to additional losses friction losses yeah also, depending upon how strong this bend is, you could have again flow circulation. So maybe I should draw another one. So the primary flow is like that. Then it could develop a secondary flow. Okay, so that is secondary flow. And then also you could have flow separations like this okay near the bend there could be certain regions which are not moving they would be separated from the main flow so these all will additionally contribute to frictional losses and therefore uh, you need to take care of uh, so you when you design something you need to know therefore if you are actually giving a bend you should think, think about what is the uh, law. So again, you will define a loss coefficient. Okay. You have to find out what is the loss coefficient for a 90 degree bend or for a smooth bend and then add that to the total frictional losses. Hmm? Um, so you might want to, for example, think about, okay, I will just avoid having all the uh, you know, bends at all, I will try to give as smooth as possible so that you can reduce the frictional losses. 
but uh, many times that may not be a good idea because you need additional space you are thinking about giving longer curvatures that means longer pipes so that long length would also cause you know additional pressure drop so you will have to estimate if is the space is available do you need actually a long pipe okay with the minimum uh, you know bend or do you need actually a short pipe with a 90 degree bend what is best required so you need to do a comparison so again cost will the operating cost will change the initial you know investment will change so you need to know which one is uh, suitable so that's why it becomes important to estimate these things and small differences here and there over a month would make a lot of difference so that's why people really worry about what are the numbers associated any questions? <clears throat> mm, that's about bends. Valves, valves, you must already be. Um, uh, you also submitted the assignment. No, I have not looked at it yet. Huh? So, you must have dealt with different kinds of valves, right? What all valves did you write about? Huh? Gate valve, okay. Then? Check valve. Then? Maybe we should have had a surprise quiz on valves today. Yeah, the, for, for, for final exam, there will be questions, okay, from assignments. So, um, yeah, so the several like, you know, disc valve, butterfly valve, globe valve, I think all of you must have written different, different things. So, um, and when you have written it, okay, you might have uh, probably found that certain kinds of valves are useful for gases, certain kind of valves are useful for liquids. Some of them have a better control. Some of them are like, you know, completely open and completely closed. Or you want to find control over your change in... Why do we need flow valves, by the way? To control the flow rate, okay? We always... So, uh, for example, you know, you um, have, a, you know, for ex a plant and there are fluids that are coming from outside, okay? Let's say for a heat exchanger, you are taking water from the nearby river. Okay, or let's say you have a um, uh, petroleum which is getting, you know, um, uh, which is coming from some port somewhere which is getting injected. So there are lots of external influences, okay, and all of them are going to affect the fluid properties that are coming in. The temperature might be different, the composition might be different. So the equipment that's under operation must be, you must be able to change your flow rate so that the equipment works the best way. Okay, so you would always want to therefore control your flow rate. Okay, that's why you would use valves. Hmm? And uh, depending upon what fluid it is, you may use different, different valves. The valves may be completely open or it may be partially open. And it's important whether it is completely open or partially open. Or partially. Because often a partially open valve will generate more pressure drop than a completely open valve okay so so therefore one needs to know how much it is open and then the pressure drop calculation should really depend upon that um, yeah and the valves the pressure the again the frictional losses are coming because of its complicated geometry okay so you must have seen all sort of complicated geometries associated with for example a globe valve and so on or a butterfly valve okay there will be um, the geometry is complicated the velocity is changing quite dramatically in the valve the you know, both magnitude and direction there could again be regions of separation so all of them will contribute additional losses and all of them will be calculated based on the loss coefficient that you get the loss coefficient is the way we defined for our uh, um, sudden expansion or contraction we defined a loss coefficient similarly when you buy, buy a valve from the manufacturer, you will get what is the loss coefficient. Or in other words, you should ask them about it. They would have done an experiment and would have calculated. So you get those numbers and use it in your design. That's the way you should go ahead. 
those numbers may not be so accurate and therefore you should give always some margin okay so typically the error could be as large as 50 percentage in those numbers because it depends all lot on you know the uh, flow conditions so it might be very different the way the manufacturer would have calculated the loss coefficient the conditions may be very different from your operating conditions so you should uh, worry about those details but typically there are some guidelines would be available which you can um, uh, take for granted and do the first uh, calculation so as and uh, um, gradual expansions and contractions so we talked about sudden expansion and contraction a pipe a small pipe suddenly getting enlarged so you would um, think that you know uh, and you realize that yeah of course the uh, major losses are coming because the you know the direction the magnitude is suddenly changing uh, also there are regions of the separation and so on so why should we have a sudden expansion or a sudden contraction we would rather go for something that is smoothly changing so that we can avoid the uh, you know sudden changes in the velocity and therefore reduce the frictional losses okay uh, the idea is okay except that the feasibility is very um, little okay so let's see if you talk about a sudden expansion so it's not sudden expansion a gradual expansion fluid is coming <clears throat> so um, so so the because the it's it's an expansion okay the velocity downstream would be smaller or bigger you have an increased area so the velocity is going to be smaller or in other words the velocity head goes down okay and uh, we have seen the energy equation now the energy equation was what there is a pressure head plus there is a contribution that will come from the elevation then there is a velocity head um, uh, and uh, these three basically balance or in other or you could have a friction right these are the four contributions that would have come up in your energy equation hmm? Now we are talking about something, let's say we don't care about the elevation change. Okay. So you could have a pressure head and a velocity head. So if the velocity comes down, that can get converted into a pressure head. That's what Bernoulli's equation really says, right? Velocity decreases, the pressure increases. So what happens is that if you have an expansion, many of, much of the kinetic energy get, can actually get converted into a pressure form. Okay. It becomes pressure head. But the difference here is that if you look at um, the fluid that's coming in, the velocity profile is going to be that, right? The velocity at the center is large, the velocity near the wall is small. So, so let's draw two streamlines, maybe one is that and one is very close. Okay, so let's call um, this um, A. So we can call it. This is A and this is B and somewhere else this is A prime, this is B prime. Okay, so A, A prime is a streamline, B, B plus B prime is a streamline. At um, uh, location A, Okay, the velocity is going to be definitely larger than the velocity at location B. Agreed? Because of the presence of the wall. At location A, not A prime, okay. At location A, which was actually part of that uniform pipe. Okay, A is slightly away from the wall and therefore A will have a larger velocity than if I, if I look at a fluid particle at location A, it will have a larger velocity than 
velocity of a fluid particle that is located at B. Or in other words, the velocity head of particle A at location A is going to be larger than B at B. Now, both A and B are the fluid particle velocities are going to slow down as it goes downstream. Okay, by the time it reaches A prime, B prime, part of the velocity head would have been converted into pressure head. Agreed. Now, it so happens that uh, the pressure itself, okay, is not going to change much across the cross section. If you look at the pressure at location A prime and pressure at location B prime, the pressure remains almost constant. Hmm? And the only way that would have happened is that because the fluid particle at location B had a smaller velocity head, it would have lost much more than the one which is at A, A prime along the streamline. Okay, or you could say that, for example, the fluid particle at location B would have come to rest by the time it reaches B prime, but the one at location A would still be moving. Okay, because the velocity head is actually getting converted into pressure head. Hmm? So, because A was coming with a larger velocity, okay, the particle at location A was coming with a larger velocity, it gets converted into pressure head. The one with at B also got converted into pressure head, but the velocity at location A would be larger than the velocity at location B, even though both of them have been the, the velocity the velocity heads have been converted into pressure head. Okay, actually taking that to uh, the limit in which you would see that if B prime actually comes to uh, you know a stagnant situation, if B prime actually comes to a halt, A prime would still be moving. So you, what you would see is that as you proceed along um, this direction you will see that B prime gets slower and slower while A prime will start moving faster and fa I mean compared to B prime, A prime will be moving faster. Okay, so the relative velocity between A prime and B prime keeps increasing. After some point what happens is that the B prime will come to zero velocity while A prime would still be moving and beyond some point you would see that B prime would actually move in the opposite direction compared to A prime. Now, whatever I said just now, we will see how the equations predict that maybe when we do the boundary layer. For the time being, let's just uh, get this fact that therefore, there can be a region where the fluid will actually start flowing in the opposite direction, even though the main flow is in a different direction. So, along the center, the fluid would be actually flowing from left to right, but near the wall, the flow could be in the opposite direction. Okay, so that's coming because of this differences in which how much velocity head is converted, getting converted into pressure head. So, the numbers, let's say, we'll see later. So, what happens is that because of that, the fluid, so even though outside this uh, layer, the fluid is in one direction, inside the fluid could actually start going in the opposite direction. Okay, so that's what you really call as flow separation. So whenever I drew flow separation there, 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 um, you know, here, in all these cases, this is what is happening. Okay, even though you have a major flow, a primary flow, there could be a flow separation, which would, um, um, uh, which would be in an opposite direction and can result in much more pressure drop. Okay, so, so even though you would want to change your sudden expansion or a sudden contraction, there could still be regions where this flow separation can occur. And it turns out that if you want to really stop flow separation, the angle of divergence that you need is less than 7 degree. So if it's uh, less than 7 degree, you will be able to reduce the uh, that separation but otherwise it's difficult to stop the separation that means if you want to get rid of a sudden expansion you should think about an expansion which is having a seven degree that means that expansion would be over a very large length because the angle is really small where you can stop separation okay so you if you want to replace a sudden expansion with a gradual expansion your pipe should be really from you know the expansion should be happening over a really long length now that becomes a problem because you want to get a pipe which is slowly changing in its cross section over a large length that's going to be really a custom made thing that you are asking for 
okay and you need to also plan how to you know space it out and so on so other costs will actually become important and material cost will also go up okay so therefore it's also not always a good idea to replace a sudden expansion with a gradual expansion unless it's um, you know really going to help us so therefore you would want to again compare whether you want a um, sudden expansion or a gradual expansion when you are designing something Okay, so it's all due to the uh, the uh, the separate the fluid that gets separated. So these regions where the reverse flow happens is called flow separation. Okay, it's separated from the main flow, and that flow separation is a reason for additional losses. So when you add, when you install something, the thing that you would look for is to not have any flow separation. Don't worry if you did not get the idea of uh, why it happens. We'll learn about it in detail when we do the boundary layer theory. So let's look at a situation. Fluid is coming in a larger pipe. Then it got contracted. And let's say you have some uh, valve. Um, Yeah. and then the fluid is going and then it suddenly expands. Let's say this is a particular section that you are interested in and you want to know what is the uh, pressure drop across this section. Let's say this is very small so Some valve is there, so something is coming here, fluid, and going out. So if you did not have that valve, and if you did not have that expansion and contraction, you would have just written down your usual um, uh, uh, loss, which we called as the friction loss HF, as F times L by D times V square by g right where we relate now f with the reynolds number so you would calculate it so remember this diameter is uh, that diameter this length is the length of the small pipe v is the average velocity in the small pipe now you have got an expansion you have got a contraction and you have a valve so you need to add three minor losses to this expression so your total loss ht Let's say we can write it as HF plus HM. The friction loss that's coming from the fully developed part of the flow plus additional minor losses. And HF, you will write it as F into L by D into V square by 2G. And minor losses could be many of them. So you have a minor loss that's going to come from the contraction, which you will write, sorry, ah, yeah, contraction, which you can write as KC into v square by 2g. Remember how we defined our uh, co loss coefficient? We defined our loss coefficient as the minor loss divided by the velocity head. So the loss coefficient times the velocity head is going to give you the minor loss. So kc which is the contraction. So I have the c subscript is for contraction. kc into v square plus 2g plus there is a val. So let us say kv into v square by 2g plus there is an expansion k e into v square by 2g. So that is the total pressure drop or the to total uh, head loss which is equal to delta p by rho g. So you know the pressure drop. Can, if you like you can write it as v square by 2g into F L by D plus sum of all minor losses.
okay so all we have said today uh, is essentially how to attack this problem okay if you are you have got a pipe design then uh, the way to proceed would be look at the loss coefficients associated with each element that you would put it in the pipe and add it to your frictional losses that's the take home message hmm?